please join me in giving a warm welcome to the CFTC's chairman, Rostin Benham. Welcome, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here today. Uh, this is the second time I've done an intro like that in the past week, so it's very exciting when I come from the back. Um, first of all, and most importantly, I want to thank you all for being here. I know we have a lot of people virtually. This is a big day for us at the CFTC. This is a big day for me, and I want to thank staff, specifically uh, Tanisha Cole Edmonds and her staff within AMWI, our Office of Minority Women Inclusion and EEO, and all the staff that helped put this together. Um, some of you may have heard of us in the past, uh, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. Many of you probably haven't, uh, and that's really why we're here today. We want to uh, shine a little bit of a light on the agency, what we do, um, the personnel and the people that make this great agency. Um, and we have been making it go and turn and work for a long time. We're going to be 50 years old uh, in a few years. Um, and we date back even further than that. But we're a financial market regulator, as many of you probably know, and we do incredibly important work um, for all Americans. Uh, and that's what's something that I care deeply about, um, what we do, the work here, because it really impacts and affects um, every individual in our country, and it's something that I take great pride in, um, and I think everyone at the CFDC does. So today is an effort to bring people together um, to showcase a little bit about the agency's work and what we do, um, and hopefully to give information um, to a new generation of CFTC employees, both young and old. Uh, and we're very excited about that. Um, we've been growing uh, a bit in the past 10 or 20 years. Our markets continue to grow. Congress has provided us with new authority to regulate new markets and markets that were previously unregulated. Um, and the work that we do really impacts people from uh, agriculture to energy to traditional financial institutions and banking to some issues around crypto and digital assets, which I'm sure many of you have read in the news lately. So we, we managed to touch on a lot of different things because that's the way um, our, our, our statute and the law requires us um, to do things, but something that we're always very um, ambitious to learn. Uh, we always have great professionals and experts who take time to think about new things and new challenges. We engage with a lot of different federal agencies on matters around banking and financial markets, but also around consumer protection. We engage a lot with, uh, with Capitol Hill and elected officials, and um, it's really just a very exciting place to work and, and a place that we're, we're looking towards a new group of individuals um, with fresh ideas, fresh experiences, and different diverse backgrounds that hopefully can make this agency a, a really a wonderful place and continue to be a wonderful place to work at for many decades to come. Um, I don't have too much time, but I did want to kind of share some thoughts about my journey and how I got into this position and a little bit about the agency. Um, in some respects, it's a unique story, but some respects, I think, you know, for those um, who are thinking about a career in public service, this is something I care deeply about. I've been in public service about 12 years now, um, having worked at, on Capitol Hill for a bit, and then I've been at the agency um, as both a commissioner and now chairman since 2017. Um, and it's, you know, it's a it's a, an incredible lifestyle. It's an incredible challenge, um, and it does afford a lot of opportunities. I think for workers, both young and old. And this is something that I see with many staff in the building. Uh, who come here and they, you know, they start working. Some so sometimes they'll say, "I'm only intending to come and work for a few years," but those years seem to tick by, and you understand and appreciate the benefits of um, the workplace, the salary, and and the work environment that you have, and you realize it's, it really is a wonderful place to start a career, to build a career, and really to take you for many years through your your professional arc. Um, I uniquely, and I think uniquely, um, and probably the only chairman who was an intern here, uh, I think about 20 years ago, um, we have four offices. We obviously have this here. Uh, this is our largest office. We're about 1,000 people. We have 700 full-time employees and 300 uh, contractors. Those are rough numbers, but I think I'm re relatively on, on target. Um, we have three other offices, one in New York, one in Chicago, and one in Kansas City. Uh, my theory goes these are really related to the markets we regulated. Historically, agricultural commodity markets were really related and or really based out of Chicago and Kansas City um, 
and New York. Uh, Washington, obviously, the, the sort of capital and the policy hub. Um, and I had the benefit of working as an intern during my second uh, summer of law school. Um, and I worked in the New York office. I grew up outside of New York. Um, and I remember vividly going to a career fair uh, at law school. I went to Syracuse Law School. And um, the individual who run the career office knew I, had tr I had, was in financial markets. I was in the finance industry right out of college. And she said, there's this interesting opportunity at the CFTC. Uh, and I knew a little bit about the CFTC. I knew a little bit about derivatives markets. Um, but I certainly did not necessarily have the agency in my crosshairs. I think often if you think about financial markets and fin financial market regulators, you think about the Federal Reserve, you think about the Securities and Exchange Commission, uh, but we do have a little bit of a patchwork here in the U.S., and they're all great agencies that touch on different parts of the financial system. Our financial markets are enormous. Our banking system is enormous here in the U.S., so I think it's justifiable that we have a lot of different uh, regulators, both market regulators and banking regulators. Um, so as I learned about this opportunity, it was a little bit of a new territory, um, exciting, um, a little bit unusual, I would say. Um, I hate to say this, but you know, when I think about that summertime and that recruitment process, it was in fact the SEC that was all over the career fair trying to recruit for their honors program. Uh, but I was really excited about this opportunity at the CFTC. I did research, uh, and lo and behold, I was, I was fortunate enough to land a job um, within the Division of Enforcement as an intern for this second year of law school. And what's most amazing now is to come back having practiced law in the private sector, having worked at the State Attorney General's office in New Jersey, and then worked on Capitol Hill for about six or seven years, and then been here for six years now as a commissioner and chair, um, to know and to have relationships with the same individuals uh, that worked at the CFTC 20 some odd years ago. Uh, and I say that in such a positive way because these are people that are committed um, career public servants. They love their job. We are doing stuff. Um, that is so groundbreaking in terms of technology and financial markets. Um, and I think as much as I get a kick out of the story, I think the folks up in New York probably get a bigger kick out of the story because I was the intern back in 2003, um, and here I am as chair, very fortunate um, and grateful for this opportunity to lead the agency. And seeing it from so many different perspectives, appreciating the work that all of the regions do um, in, our, in our agency, and and appreciating all of the work that contributes to the health of the American economy um, and really this, the sustainability and growth and prosper, um, prosperous notion of the, of the U.S. economy and the country. So these are the types of things I think about. And you know, as I think back on these 20 years, I often get questions, as my colleagues do, the commissioners, about you know, what's your career advice and why the CFTC or why public service. And, you can never really predict where your career is going to be, but I do think service for the, for, uh, in the public sector is an incredible experience. Um, if it is what you choose and do for your entire career, I have no doubt it's going to be beneficial, it's going to be fulfilling, um, and it's going to be something that drives you to joy and, and build relationships both on a personal and professional level. Uh, but at a minimum, I think as citizens, as people who care deeply about this country, um, it's an opportunity to advance your career, to learn, to be exposed to so many different things that you otherwise would not be exposed to in the private sector. Um, and that's what's so unique about this agency and the markets we regulate, again, from agriculture to energy to large financial institutions and really sort of groundbreaking work in technology. It feels like we're, we're constantly trying to catch up with what's going on in the private sector, um, but people and industries and institutions appreciate the work we do, the expertise we have, um, and the impact we have um, on our on our great country. So, um, again, you know, as I think about what we can do, and as you take steps, perhaps towards a career here, um, one day, whether it's sooner or later, we just want you to keep us in mind. Uh, we'd love to learn a little bit about you, and we want you to learn a little bit about what we do here. Um, and we're constantly looking for um, new professionals. Things ebb and flow, of course, with budgets uh, and, and staff retiring or, or leaving. But we want you to keep us in mind to learn a little bit about us um, and to understand and appreciate the value of public service. Um, it's a, it's a, an incredible opportunity 
to learn and potentially use this as a springboard for something down the road, but also I think as you learn over the next few hours about the division, different divisions we have, the different experts we have, um, I'm hopeful that you'll appreciate and understand uh, why it's such a great place to work and why I, I've been so fortunate um, to be the chair here, commissioner here, and, and to work with many colleagues um, across the country. So um, really appreciate you all being here. Uh, this is a really an exciting day for us. It's, it is a moment, I think, for this agency to pivot a little bit and to expand our reach to hopefully a new constituency of individuals who want to find um, a new line of career work um, and, and relationships, and that, that's really what we're trying to do. We're trying to pull in diverse individuals um, who can make this agency stronger from the ground up um, and hopefully build a, an agency for many years to come. You know, these, these, these markets continue to change, and as we've dealt with incredible impacts from COVID and, and geopolitical issues and macro and microeconomic issues here in, in, in the U.S., um, every single event impacts our markets, and every event of the markets impacts real people um, here in, in Washington, D.C., but across the country. And those are the types of real-life experiences that I think we all appreciate here as employees and understand and know why our work is so important um, and incredible as we you know, come in every day uh, and think about the impact that we have uh, on our country. So whatever we can do, I hope, I hope today is a great day for all of you. I hope you ask many questions and, and hopefully can learn a lot about us here at the CFDC. And certainly, as we look forward to the future, uh, please keep us in mind um, and tell the story, uh, because it's a good story and one that we hope we can um, build a relationship off of and, and uh, continue to teach folks about the CFDC and ultimately um, be successful in the future. So I'm going to leave it there. Thanks again for being here, both in person and virtually. And I think I'm going to hand it over to our um, Director of Office of Minority Women and Inclusion, Tanisha Cole Edmonds. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Benham, and thank you all for being here today. Good afternoon. You made it. You braved all the traffic, the road closures, and you're here, and we are so excited to see you. Welcome to the CFTC. As Chairman Benham said, my name is Tanisha Cole Edmonds. My pronouns are she, her, and I am the CFTC's Chief Diversity Officer and Director of the Office of Minority and Women Inclusion. I also want to offer an inclusive introduction of myself. I am an African-American woman with brown eyes and shoulder-length brown curly hair, and I am wearing a cream suit bravely. We are so excited to welcome you to today's Career Forum, which is the culmination of an intentional outreach and engagement strategy my team and I launched this year to meet all of you and to introduce you to our amazing agency. A total of 650 students and recent graduates registered for this forum, and we are so glad to have so many of you in person and online with us today. Collectively, you represent over 200 colleges and universities, including minority-serving institutions, women's colleges, and law schools studying law, data science, computer science, finance, accounting, and, and economics, among other majors. It's amazing. A special acknowledgement to the participants on Zoom. We see you, we know you're here, and we're here with you too. An event like this takes time and a huge amount of coordination and collaboration. And I want to acknowledge my entire Omwe team, many of whom are running around somewhere here, um, but particularly my outreach and engagement specialists, Derek Wilson and Kamir Carrillo, led by my associate director, Kim Oliver, who have been hard at work planning this forum for months. Thank you. I also want to acknowledge all of the CFTC offices and teams that partnered and collaborated with us, including the Office of Pub excuse me, the Office of Public Affairs, Facilities, Audiovisual, 
human resources, information technology, and security. And also a warm welcome and acknowledgement of our partners from the Office of Personnel Management. Thank you. Over the next three afternoons, you will have the opportunity to meet and engage with CFT staff from every operating division in our agency, as well as the Office of International Affairs, Office of Chief Economist, and Office of Technology Innovation. Thank you to my colleagues on the executive leadership team and to the CFT staff and representatives from our affinity groups who volunteered to be here today to meet you in person and online during our panels over the next two afternoons. Okay, so diversity, equity, inclusion, accessibility. What does it mean and why does it matter? For the CFTC and as reflected in our vision statement, it means many voices, one CFTC. It means that we embrace diversity as a strength and understand that transparency Fairness and equity must guide decision making. It means we understand that everyone is accountable for contributing to a respectful, safe, and inclusive, collaborative, accessible workplace culture so that opportunities and means to excel are available to all. I love our vision statement. We are striving to live up to it every day by intentionally engaging in outreach and building a culture that not only is capable of attracting diverse top talent like you, but that centers its people and its leaders on the immense power of being a place where everyone feels like they have a space and a place at the CFTC to be yourself and maximize your potential. A place where you can grow, where your particular brilliance is acknowledged, encouraged, and is lit, not dimmed. Why? because the future of work includes you, all of you. It's your time, it's your turn. This industry is yours if you choose it and the CFTC's doors are open to you. You are the next generation of analysts, data scientists, attorneys, investigators, economists, and management professionals. Your voices, your creativity, your you, every bit of you, all parts of you, is going to help us become the most creative, most innovative, smartest, most thoughtful market regulator in the world. Not only that, we offer an opportunity to do well and do good. Public service is where it's at. So with that, I hope you have a wonderful afternoon. We have a wonderful afternoon planned for you. So let's get started. Now, I have the pleasure of introducing our commissioners to offer opening remarks. I must note that this is the most diverse set of commissioners in the CFTC's history. All women, all unanimously confirmed by the Senate, and in order of appearance, I am pleased and it is my pleasure to welcome Commissioner Kristen Johnson, who is a nationally recognized expert on financial markets, risk management, law, and policy, with specialization in the regulation of complex financial markets, including the organization, distribution, and secondary market trading, clearing, and settlement of securities and derivatives. Commissioner Summer Mersinger served as the Chief of Staff to the CFTC prior CFTC Commissioner Don D. Stump. She also served as the Director of the Office of Legislative and Intergovernmental Affairs at the CFTC under former Chairman Heath Tarbert. Commissioner Christy Goldsmith Romero could not be here with us today, but has prepared a video to welcome you. Commissioner Goldsmith Romero, served for a decade as the Special Inspector General for TARP, also known as SIGTARP, where she led a nationwide federal law enforcement agency and watchdog program. Commissioner Goldsmith Romero has received national recognition for her work. And finally, Commissioner Carolyn Pham. Commissioner Pham also was unable to join us today, but has offered 
a video to welcome you as well. She is an internationally recognized leader in financial services compliance and regulatory strategy and policy with deep expertise in derivatives and capital markets and emerging issues such as digital in innovation. And without further ado, I welcome Commissioner Kristen Johnson. Oh, there she is. Hi, good afternoon. Thanks so much for joining us here at the CFTC. I am tremendously elated that you have chosen our commission, our agency, uh, to consider as part of the next chapter, the next phase, the next step in your career path, which I have no doubt is going to be exciting and will bring lots of benefits, not just to your own edification and growth as a professional, but also to those around you. I am serving currently as a commissioner of the CFTC and grateful for President Biden's nomination uh, and the Senate's confirmation affirming my ability to serve in this position. But I think we all can imagine that uh, in fifth grade, I wasn't sitting at a table working on multiplication or division or whatever happens in fifth grade and thinking that I would be a commissioner at the CFTC. In fact, I don't even think that in law school, I spent time thinking that I would be the commissioner of a federal agency. What I did know from a very early age is that I am deeply enamored with all things math and that I was drawn in ways that I couldn't exactly explain because they were not necessarily um, near and dear to my growing up experience or by my experience as a child or in childhood and uh, in early education. But I was drawn tremendously to economics and economic theory. I am tremendously interested in law and I couldn't imagine how those things might ultimately come together as I looked at the many career paths before me when I graduated college and then when I graduated law school. Um, what I'd like to say is, I think our path finds us. And if that might actually be true, then I'm here to illustrate for you that your path can find you. I went to law school after having spent time on Wall Street at an investment bank because I was interested in finance. But I knew I wanted to be a lawyer. And when I arrived at law school, I had this tremendously um, fixed impression of what I would do upon graduating law school. I would become a civil rights lawyer. I would be the very next Thurgood Marshall. Um, I have never set foot in a courtroom for purposes of practicing civil litigation in my life. Uh, but at the heart of my motivation was a thought um, that I could use the talents and skills that I have to protect people who have less of a voice in our community, in our society. And I'm really hopeful that no matter uh, how much I'm drawn to economic theory and to finance in the most complex sense. I'm also every day, as part of the, the efforts I undertake, as part of how my time is allocated, expressly engaging in opportunities to directly impact the lives of people who are working with me and working around me, but also using this platform to elevate the voices of people who have very little opportunity to be heard in these spaces. Um, I have, I hope, also in the course of my, my time at the CFTC um, really done the substantive and hard work, I think it's almost impossible to avoid, um, of engaging deeply in the issues that are at the core and forefront of our markets. So saying just a little bit about those couple of things, I'll try to be brief and uh, yield the floor quickly as you, I'm sure, are excited to hear from our fellow commissioners and even more so from people who might be directly engaged in hiring. Um, but to give a little background to the three things I suggested, uh, first, my tremendous interest in finance. So I've come to the CFTC as a lawyer who has practiced both at a law firm and private practice, uh, in-house counsel at J.P. Morgan, and then for a decade, I worked as a law professor, a tenured academic with an endowed professorship, and that is the position to which I, the position which I departed to come to the CFTC. In each of those instances, I had a different type of engagement with finance, and the, in fact, the very last paper I published, I feel, was a precy to my service here at the CFTC. I wrote one of the first academic papers published uh, in a legal academic journal exploring secondary market trading for crypto assets. 
um, notwithstanding a tremendous buzz in academia and globally around ICOs at the time, I knew that there was something really important that we had to think about in the context of how these assets traded in secondary markets. What were the guardrails? What were the limitations? What were our expectations? How would we structure the markets that would facilitate or enable trading in this asset class? Most of my legal academic career, in fact, has been focused on those kinds of questions for different types of assets. Um, so arriving at the CFTC, I had some experience and exposure and a passion for one substantive issue. But as the chair mentioned, the commission covers many, uh, everything from energy to precious metals to agricultural commodities as well. And so going to my second point quickly, I suggested to you that I wanted to be very much engaged in creating opportunities to be thoughtful about those who have very little access to platforms like this. So. I'll draw the thread from the crypto discussions to begin with and suggest that on Juneteenth last year, uh, I believe it was a first of its kind uh, Juneteenth celebration, uh, largely because I think last year, someone will correct me if I'm wrong, and I don't mean 2023, I mean 2022, um, we had uh, our first annual Juneteenth program here at the CFTC. I was invited by the affinity group uh, that supports the programming for that particular program to offer remarks or to have a fireside chat. Uh, I assume no one ever wants to hear from me. Uh, so what I decided was, was that it would be better to offer that platform to a diverse group of support of, of folks who support senators on the Hill who are working for different senators' offices or working in different public advocacy spaces. So I invited folks from Cory Booker's office. I invited someone from uh, Chairwoman Debbie Stabenow's office, chair of the Senate Ag Committee. I invited someone to come from one of the market participants, Coinbase, uh, in the crypto space. I invited someone to come from uh, the National Urban League and the NAACP Legal Defense Fund to talk about what crypto has meant for diverse communities. It is just a small example of one of the ways that I am deeply hopeful that I can leave uh, my thumbprint or fingerprint on my time of service here at the CFTC. Uh, drawing more broadly and raising questions beyond just crypto, uh, but thinking about communities who have not had nearly sufficient a voice, in my opinion, in the conversations that we're having at the commission or more broadly across Washington, D.C. Uh, I spent some time in Kenya, East Africa, South Africa, and Ghana, West Africa last year. Uh, my, goal of, my goal for spending time there was to begin to build deeper alliances and deeper relationships uh, with folks in those countries who are developing agricultural commodities markets. Um, I've also spent time with folks from continents all over the world and at conferences all over the world. Um, but I raise those examples simply because I think that we have a tremendous obligation in every instance to give back. And so part of that obligation for me is not just with my staff, with the staff here at the CF FTC with people in the community around me, but also with those who are part of the global community because we're global citizens. I want to just close out by saying all of this uh, maybe describes some portion of the opportunities I've had to serve in this role, uh, none of which would have been what they've been, but for the staff who've come out of private practice or from different ranks here at the CFTC to help my office be successful. Unlike the chair, I didn't grow up here at the CFTC. I was an intern in other spaces and places and a paralegal before I was a lawyer and many other jobs, including my very first job as a cashier at our local grocery store in my neighborhood. <laughs> Again, nothing of which exactly would have suggested that I would land in this space. And I say that simply to say two additional things as I part. The first is seize every Every opportunity presented to you and the second is build 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 the network where you are and in every space that you land because I feel grateful for every person I've had an opportunity to work with here at the CFTC and I know that they have impacted me my hope is that I also have had positive impacts on their growth and development as well thanks so much Hi, good afternoon. Um, Commissioner Johnson is always a hard act to follow. Uh, and she also has a wonderful experience as a professor. So she is very good at presenting. Um, I can barely help my children with their homework. So I don't know what you're going to get. I have about four talking points here. Um, so it, you could get a very interesting um, you know, discussion. But I, I, 
wanted to welcome everyone, both in person and virtually, uh, to the first of its kind career and, um, you know, this this forum is new to this agency, but long overdue. And thank you to Amwi and Tanisha and her staff for putting this on. We should have been doing this long before, and I'm glad that we finally are at this point because we do need um, people to get excited about public service again. Um, it is a joy to work for the government. That probably sounds odd. Um, you probably don't hear that a lot. But I think that is an opportunity to do a job where you go in every day and you realize that you're part of something bigger than you. That it may be a small part too, but you are part of a larger mission. And that's really one of the advantages of working in public service in the government sector versus, you know, I, I'm sure you can get that feeling from private sector as well, but as someone who has had both experiences, it's, it doesn't feel the same as when you're working for the government and you know that you are helping citizens live their life um, under the protections of, of the government. So because I gave myself such few talking points here, I figured I will just talk about myself so that it's easy to uh, offer <laughs> something to say. So just real quick, um, as Tanisha mentioned, um, I came in as part of uh, four women commissioners to the agency. It was the most diverse group. Um, ever to be part of this agency. We do have a long history of women being commissioners, but certainly not uh, the majority of the, the commission being commissioners. And we all have very diverse backgrounds. My background is much different than Commissioner Johnson. She had a lot of great financial experience. Um, my experience was more on the agricultural side, uh, which is where our agency gets its roots. And just to talk a little bit about that and kind of you know how I got here as well, I grew up um, in the middle of nowhere in South Dakota on a farm. Um, my parents started farming right out of high school. They were dirt poor. Um, in fact, I, I don't tell people this often, but I almost brought it up yesterday during a meeting that I had. Someone was talking about um, how you can deliver a commodity and how electricity is a commodity that moves, you know, you have to move it along, but most commodities you have to, you know, it can be delivered somewhere. And somebody used ex the example of a house. And I thought, I almost spoke up and said, well, I grew up in a trailer house and that could have been moved at any time. Um, in fact, I remember more than once the trailer house being pulled to a new location on the ranch. So, um, but, you know, that's, that's where I started, and that's where my parents started. And I watched them build a, you know, they, they built a farm. My dad f has his own land now. Um, they, they really built a future for us. Um, I was the first one to go to college, uh, the first one to, you know, go to law school for sure. Um, and I think part of that, you know, just one, seeing them build their life and their career, but also, you know, seeing how a community works together um, to lift people up, it's really what drove me into public service. And so right out of college, I actually packed up my two-door Saturn and drove all my stuff to DC uh, to work for my home state senator. And when I was interviewing there, they said, well, the only job we have open is for you to answer the phones and open mail. And I said, I don't care if I have to like make coffee and hold the door. I just want the opportunity. And that led to so many additional open doors. Um, you know, working in Congress was a fantastic experience. Um, I went to law school at night. I don't recommend that to anyone, um, but it can be done. And it really just kind of, you know, led me here, which is not anywhere I would have ever thought that I would be. Um, again, you know, my background's in agriculture. I did some financial services work in the United States Senate. Um, but I never really thought about ending up um, at a, a small federal agency. But I think 
it's important to to remember to you know, as Kristen said, like, take every opportunity. So the reason I ended up here, I was actually working in the private sector um, at a lobbying firm, really enjoying it. Commissioner Stump at the time, who I knew her from the Senate, she said to me, you know, the new chairman of the agency is looking for someone to do legislative affairs. He wants agricultural background and some Hill experience. And would you be interested? Never had thought about working here. Um, but I said, absolutely. And you know that wasn't that long ago, and, and now I've been confirmed as a commissioner. I'm actually up again um, to be confirmed again, hopefully. So it was one of those where I could have said, no, I'm not interested. I'm just going to stay doing what I'm doing. But you know, I, I thought it was a new opportunity. It was a new, you know, something new, something exciting, something I hadn't done. Um, so I, I took her up on that, and, and clearly it was the right move. Um, so the other thing I'll say is this agency itself, I think, is very unique. Um, as soon as I arrived here, as soon as I started working here, in my mind, I wanted to stay here. This is a, there's a great staff, extremely smart people, and every single day I learn something new, which I think is really unique. Um, so there's just so much to learn. We cover so many different, um, you know, product and 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 asset classes and and activities that y it never gets boring. Um, and so I think this agency has a lot of lot to offer, which is again why I'm really happy we're doing this. Um, and I'll just end by saying, you know. It, to Kristen's point about networking, you know, make those connections, get to know people, get to know as many people here as you possibly can, um, because that's going to help you. Even if it's even if your future is not here, uh, that's going to help you find your next position or help you find the right place for you to land. So, make those connections, keep those connections, and then when you get to a point where where you are in a place that that you know you want to be and that you enjoy working reach back to others who are trying to take that step, who are trying to figure out what, what, they, what to do next. Be a mentor, <laughs> you know, find, be a mentee, but then become a mentor. Um, I think that gets lost sometimes, that you know, people get to where they're going and, and then they forget to try to help someone else get there. Um, but I think that is critical. And you'd be surprised, sometimes your mentee then goes far beyond what you know what you expected, and maybe they're in a position to help you again. So it really is you know you want to you want to build those that networking. You want to build those relationships. You want to keep those relationships, and always be looking for opportunities to help others. So with that, I am going to turn it back to Tanisha for a couple of videos from my fellow commissioners. Um, but I'm just. Please, that all of you are here today and, and take full advantage of the opportunity because I think you're going to meet a lot of great people, hear a lot of cool job experiences and opportunities, and I think you'll walk away here loving this agency as much as I do. Thank you. Welcome to the CFTC. I wish I was there to welcome you in person, uh, but I'm at a FinTech conference talking about artificial intelligence. That's the type of really important and exciting things that we get to work on at the CFTC. We have a lot of cutting edge FinTech work, and it'd be really great to bring in students and young professionals who could be the future of our important work. I'll warn you though that it's challenging. It's challenging to figure out the best way to approach AI, and crypto and climate, but it's also really rewarding because you can be part of the solution. And that has such meaning and purpose. I've spent 21 years in the federal government. And just before this job, I was also an adjunct professor at UVA Law and Georgetown Law. So I'm gonna share with you what I always shared with my students. And that's how incredibly meaningful public service is. I hope you choose public service at some point in your career. Your time is valuable, and you should spend it every day doing something that you care about. I did the large law firm route 
as an associate. And then I left because what I was doing really didn't feel meaningful to me or that I had purpose. And I'm going to share with you this story from my law firm days that I usually share with my students. So years ago, I was on an Amtrak train and I was coming back from this big win I had in court for my client. And right next to me on the train is Benji Madden. At the time he was at he was in this band, this new band called Good Charlotte. And he was coming back from New York. He had just won an MTV uh, VMA award for best new band. He's now married to Cameron Diaz. And we got to talking and he wanted to know what I did and what I'd been doing that day because I was wearing a suit. And I, I started telling him and he said, hmm, do you like doing that? And I thought, no, I, I really don't. And I thought, well, that's not right. I'm working hard. I'm spending all this time and I'm not really liking what I do or care about it. So I ended up going to the SEC soon after the Securities and Exchange Commission. And I've had these amazing experiences and opportunities that I never would have gotten in the private sector. And I have had the fortune to be appointed by both President Obama and President Biden to positions. When I looked around, I thought the CFTC was right at the center of so much of what was happening. I definitely wanted to work on climate issues. And what we do is directly tied to climate because drought and storms and wildfires impact agriculture and energy. We also cover the metals market and that ties to the electrification of America. And I've been teaching cryptocurrency regulation in law school and that falls around uh, under us too because we have cryptocurrency futures that are tra trading, Bitcoin futures and ether futures. And we also bring enforcement cases against crypto scams. And then cybersecurity is also a priority for mine. This is my public service, and each of you can serve, making the world a better place one day at a time, one issue at a time. So think about bringing your skills and your talents to the CFTC, whether it's through an internship or a full-time job. I wish you the best of luck. I hope at some point in your career, you will choose public service. Good afternoon. I'm so pleased to be able to contribute to the CFTC's Career Forum, and I'd like to thank Tanisha Cole Edmonds, Chief Diversity Officer and the Office of Minority and Women Inclusion Director for planning this event. Recruiting and hiring diverse top talent is crucial for the overall success of our organization. I have been vocal about the importance of opportunities like developing talent pipelines, I think today's event is an important tool for the agency to seek out diverse top talent, and I hope we continue to see more in the future. Developing talent is critical not only for personal growth, but the overall success of any organization. Not only that, but it creates a culture of continuous learning and growth, which not only invigorates an organization, but is vital in a rapidly changing world. I am happy to share why I believe the CFTC is a wonderful place for you to take your careers. I myself was a CFTC intern in not only our Division of Enforcement, but also for former CFTC Commissioner Scott O'Malia during the Dodd-Frank Act implementation. I've also interned at other U.S. government agencies like the Securities and Exchange Commission and the Office of the Controller of the Currency. In all of these internships, I truly appreciated the way that I was able to develop hands-on experience and expertise by working with the top talent at each agency. And the CFTC internship stood out to me so much that I accepted an offer to come back and work as a special counsel and policy advisor for Commissioner O'Malley. What I distinctly remember about being at the CFTC earlier in my career, and what I want you all to keep in mind when you consider applying, is that you have to have a job that you love going to work at every day. And every day that I came to work at the CFTC, I truly enjoyed it. I had the best colleagues and the warmth and appreciation for all of our talent was something that particularly stood out to me. My fellow councils in the other offices were warm and collaborative and collegial. And I fondly remember working, even though they were long days and nights, that we were getting the rules out the door to implement Dodd-Frank to make our financial system stronger and to truly promote what was best for the United States and the American people. I believe that all of our commissioners help our markets in each special individual way. And that's why I'm so pleased to be able to speak to you about the importance of coming to work at the CFTC. Even if we all have different perspectives that make all of our contributions unique, 
We all work together to keep the CFTC's mission in mind and to find a way to collaborate and get the work done. I also remember working with the staff on so many different rules. I've always been so impressed by not only our operating division and their subject matter expertise, but extremely grateful for their dedication, good humor, and professionalism in making sure that our rules deliver the best results and make solving challenging and complex issues a real treat. My career took me a different route after the CFTC to the private sector, but I'm so pleased that I've been able to return to the CFTC for the fourth time and now as a commissioner and part of the commission that leads the agency. I'm thrilled to be here and I hope you all consider applying for positions to be able to have the kind of career building experience that I did. And I hopefully look forward to working with you and all of the colleagues here at the CFTC in the future. All right, thank you to each of our commissioners for those wonderful opening and welcoming remarks. Now, are you ready? We are moving on to our featured, speecher, featured speaker for this afternoon, Alex Trimble. Before I introduce Alex, I want to give a brief disclaimer with thanks to our colleagues in the Office of General Counsel. Mr. Trimble is a guest of the CFTC and does not represent the CFTC. The views and opinions expressed by him in either his remarks or his presentation are his and do not necessarily represent the view of the CFTC or the United States. Now, Alex is the founder and CEO of GPS Leadership Solutions, a sought after speaker, executive coach, author, and consultant with a passion for developing high performing leaders. Alex's mission is to empower ambitious leaders to achieve their personal and professional goals by fostering clarity, intentionality, and leveraging strategic relationships across all facets of life and business. His revolutionary four-step methodology, the 4C Connection Model, drives this transformation. Get up here, Alex. We can't wait to hear from you. Thank you so much, Matt. How, how many of y'all want power? By, by raise a hand, like power, like real power. You can make anything happen. That, that, that clean, uncut, you can, whatever you wanna say, whatever you wanna do happens. See, not everyone's hands up. <laughs> and, and, I, and I was like you, right? Um, way back in my career, when I was young, get this, um, I was having lunch with the former deputy director of the National Park Service, and, and him and I were chatting. He said, Alex, what do you want? What are your goals? And I said, well, you know, I want to do good, you know? I want to help people. I want to, I want to get a promotion. He said, I, well, well, stop, stop, stop. What do you want? What are your goals? And I, I took a second. I, I, I looked around, make sure no one was looking. I said, I want power. I want influence. I want the ability to snap and make something happen. And he said, great, let's make it happen, let's do it. But, but why did you say it in the first place? I said, well, you know, when I, when I say that, when I say I want power, when I say I want influence, people look at me differently. They, they, they start to look at me like I'm self-centered, like I'm, like I'm into myself. And he said, Alex, you need to read a book. I'm going to tell you, this book changed my life, Love and Power. The first thing that book taught me was that power is not good, not bad. Power is just the ability to make things happen, right? It's influence. Every single person who's a leader has some degree of power, right? That's the first thing. But the really cool thing about it was that it made a very stark distinction. First, we talk about love. How many of y'all have love in your heart? Yeah? Y'all, uh, you have compassion for others, right? Yeah, compassion, yeah. Love and compassion without power is nothing. I'm gonna use the baby seals. Baby seals are so cute. I love their little cheeks. You can love the baby seals and you want the best for the baby seals. But if you don't have the power, the influence to, 
to write legislation to protect them, right? To, to, to ensure that, that the places and spaces where they're at aren't polluted. To, to raise money for them, to, to support, to actually help them. You're not actually helping the baby sales. See, love and compassion without the influence and power to do something about it doesn't do anything. But on the other side, if you have power, you have that influence, you can do whatever you want to do, but you don't have love and compassion, you're a tyrant, right? You hurt people. You step, whoever's in your way, you, you, you just you kick them out the way, right? Because they're between you and what you want to accomplish. So the trick in life is, is not to just think about love and, and, and compassion. And it's not just power. It's the combination of both. History shows us that every single leader who's accomplished anything of significance for the greater good and for those around them have always had a combination of both power and love. Can I assume that everyone in here has some love in their heart, right? Everyone has some compassion? So our, our question becomes not whether this, this is true, but whether we will be adding your name to this list. So what I want to do is talk to you all today about um, you know, some of the, the strategies that I've learned over the years that allowed me to assume positions of, of power and influence so that I have the ability to use my, my love and careness to actually impact good. Does that sound like a plan? Can we talk about this? Does that sound like a plan? Can we talk about this? Yes. Thank you. Y'all so quiet. <laughs> so first thing, thank you so much for the really kind introduction. I greatly appreciate it. Again, I will say um, industrial and organizational psychologist, um, emphasis on executive leadership development and um, culture and organizational development. Um, I say it because I'm a researcher. And I say it because people like to say that IO psychologists aren't scientists and boo them. Okay, we are scientists. And I said to say, we, we, I help organizations, some of y'all laughing, I say <laughs> I help organizations create and, um, and develop cultures that attract, retain, and develop high potential leaders, right? So that background. The next goes into leadership development, speaker, that's what I'm doing here today, and the whole, so the, um, the podcast, Executive Appeal. I say this because I love being around all of you. I love traveling the country, talking to leaders such as yourself, and helping you deba develop the, the skills, the, the resources, the, the inspiration and motivation to actually make change, right? Versus sitting in a chair and just hoping that one day something happens, right? So, so that, that's the second facet. But the third facet of my life is executive coaching. And, and, and this is where I want to take a second, because I get to have conversations with ridiculous leaders, people who are SVPs, VPs, chief uh, CEOs, and so on and so forth, Fortune 500, Fortune 100 companies, and we get, every time we have a conversation, the first thing we do when we're beginning a relationship is, is, is help them understand what they want. What do you want? How many of y'all know what you want right now? Raise a hand. See, there's it? a lot of hands. The problem is, though, is when we get into these conversations, it's not really what they think they want. It's not what they truly want. What they, what they think they want is actually what they think they need. Why? Well, because society pushes us to believe that if you want more, if you want to be exceptional, if you want grand things, then you are greedy. Because if, if, if you want some greatness, and you're willing to do something about it, if you achieve it, now she can't have nothing. That's, that's dumb. Because you can do what you want, and she can do what she want, right? So why do we focus so, so heavily on these needs? I, and then the idea of needs is just stupid. Sorry, I'm, I'm not sure if I can say that. Can I use the, the S word? Um, I, I don't use bad words. Uh, let me ask y'all a question. What do humans need in order to survive. Just going to shout out, what do humans need in order to survive? Go on. Water, shelter, clothing, huh? Other people? Other people, sir? Food? Security? See, so some of y'all, you know, Maslow's hierarchy needs and so on and so forth, wrong. I'm about to get published through. 
or, or I'm going to get turned. Someone's going to throw me, you know, yeah. Humans need three things. Food, water, oxygen. That's what we need, right? To survive, right? You know, someone said shelter. Unfortunately, do you, do you believe there are people out there who don't have shelter who are alive right now? Some people said clothing. Unfortunately, aren't there people out there right now alive who don't have clothing? That means that if these three things are the only things we need, everything else in life is a want. So why not want the best for you? Why not want something exceptional? Why, why, if you want shelter, why not? I, I don't want to just do this, this little house right here. No, I, if, I, if I want something, let's go after it. Let's do it. Want the best for yourself. And I, I make this very important distinction because what you want, you get. If you're willing to put the effort, the energy into it, you put the investment, you, you follow the strategy and the ideas that, that leaders such as me teach, then you'll get it. But if you're wanting the bare minimum, I, we just heard a commissioner who said that she, she wrote the first article dealing with the secondary mar markets. She wanted to do something like here. She wasn't just shooting down here. Figure out what you want. Now, it, I don't blame y'all, and you all don't blame you. Because the, the reality is it's not you. You didn't, you didn't push this on yourself. See, the reality is our society pushes us to be average. I'm not going to call any names and get myself in trouble. Everyone online, if, if this goes off, you know I got myself in trouble. <laughs> Who are people always talking about in the news? The middle class, right? The middle class. What does middle mean? Middle, average, right? Um, corporations always talking about the, 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 the typical customer, right? right? Typical is average. They got creative with the language, but it's still average, right? We, we are pushed so hard to become average that when you do want something exceptional, when you are willing to work as hard as you can to get what you want, someone else will say, calm down, chill out, take a vacation, YOLO. Are people still saying YOLO? Okay, YOLO. And you know what's worse? If you do push back and say, no, 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 I know I want more than just the bare minimum, then they're going to start talking about you. Man, Stacey over here always doing too much. She's making us look bad. How come Kim is always, you know, trying to stand up? Like, like just, just, just chill. Just chill. But I need everyone here to understand what average is. And y'all understand it more than everyone, right? How much does the average person have ready for retirement who's getting ready for retirement? $114,000, approximately. Sorry, yeah, $114,000. That's not good, but it's average. The, 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 the average person can go a month or two without a job, without a paycheck, before going to financial strife. That's not good, but it's average. The average person isn't happy in their job. The average person isn't mentally and physically healthy right now. My point, average is not good. So don't shoot after average. Identify what you want and make it the biggest want you can ever think of. And then do that, because I promise you'll be so much happier. And I got to make a really quick distinction. Find what's happy for you, not your neighbor. Not your friends. So what so happens so often right now is that I'm gonna look at that person over there, and I'm gonna say, "Oh shoot, they got that that fancy new car. They got that that, that fancy new house. They on that new, that vacation. Oh shoot, I want I, I I should be doing that." You work hard, you invest, you're committed, you get it, then you're not happy because it's not what you wanted. It's what the next person wanted. So I encourage you, take the time, slow down, quiet your mind. Do it today, tonight. Spend some time truly thinking about what do you want? Because once you know that, then we can develop a plan and strategy to help you get there. The next thing, again, I, I love the commissioners with talking. 
Go big or go home. When you identify what you want to do, then look for opportunities to, to, to grow that are bigger than you. I still remember when I was offered the opportunity to serve as the, the chief culture and uh, communications officer for this big national nonprofit organization. I was scared. At that point, I was, I was serving as the chief of staff or uh, one of the chief of staff in the National Park Service. And I was talking to my mentor and I was like, man, I'm not sure if I should do this. Like, like this is a big job, it's a big jump. And, and, and my mentor questioned, hey, Alex, are, are you ready for this? And I said, maybe 60, 70%. He said, good. If you're going after an opportunity that you're sure you can do, it's not the right opportunity. You need to be going and putting yourself in situations and, and, taking, on, and, and taking on challenges and, and, and jobs and, and, and details and, 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 and internships that scare you, that makes you nervous. Why? Because that means that in order to be successful in that new venture, you have to change. You have to grow. You have to become a better version of yourself. Put yourself in situations where you have to become a better version. Don't just, don't just chill through life. Because if you chill, then one, it's going to be boring, I promise you. And second, you'll end up in the average group. Let me be real quick. Let me take a step back. When I'm saying average, I'm not talking about average as compared to next person. I'm talking about average as compared to you. What you're capable of. What your wants and desires are. I think you be real careful with that one. Second, be confident in your incompetence. Sorry, third, I was, I was interviewed for a, um, a radio show a few years back, and they said, Alex, you know what? Uh, you were responsible for creating and managing the executive leadership development program for the US Department of the Interior when you were 23. Then they asked you to manage three government-wide leadership development programs. That's crazy. How are you successful at this? And the answer came just like this. I promise you. Was, I, said, I said, I was confident in my incompetence. I know. I don't know all the answers, which makes it so easy for me to go find someone who does. You don't need to act like you know everything because you don't know everything. I promise you, you don't know everything. My mom tells, shoot, my wife tells me I don't know everything. I don't agree with her. <laughs> but it's okay. Because once you are aware that you don't know everything, that, 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 that you can be a leader, right? Build a team around you, get the next people, the, the, the smartest people in the room with you, then it's gravy. It's gravy, baby. I don't know, I feel like I should be a preacher at some point. Um, <laughs> And then I want you to know that you're stronger than what you think. I, I kind of threw this slide in here at the last minute because I, I wanted to make a quick point for all of you. You know, as you're, as you're going down this pipeline, as, as you're deciding what you want in life, as you're going big and going home, as you then, you, you, you spend the time in, in, to become confident with your incompetence, sometimes it's not going to work, right? Think, things aren't just going to work. But there's this, there's this, this idea I, I thought of, that, again, I wanted to share with you, is like, how many of y'all have been through a really tough time in your life? I just raised hand. You don't got to say it. Like, it, it, was, it, was, it was challenging. It was dark. It hurt. You, you weren't sure you were going to make it through, right? I love science, again, remember. This is how I know you're strong. Because all of y'all just identified that you've been through a challenging time, you've been through a dark time, you've been through a time that was uncomfortable, you weren't sure if you were gonna make it through, yet you're here today, right? This is not a, a kumbaya, rainbows and, 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 and jelly beans situation. This is fact. You are here today. The fact that you were able to raise your hand means that you overcame whatever it was that you were dealing with at that time. 
You became strong enough to overcome, and I promise you, you'll be able to do the same thing in the future. Because every day you will go through a challenge, and that means every day you will grow and become stronger. So it means as long as you keep moving forward, you will be okay. So please know that you are stronger than what you know. And know that you don't got to do it alone. See, th th this is one of my, my favorite topics, actually. I do a lot of speaking on, on relationships now. Because uh, a few years ago, I, I did a... Um, I did a survey. I, I began with LinkedIn.com, just interviewing you know, people who had been in you know, C-suite level, C level positions and so on and so forth. And then I started um, uh, doing literature review and so on and so forth. And I asked them, like, what made you successful? What, what, what allowed you to not only become successful, but remain successful? Because there's a difference. And they all just said the same thing. It wasn't hard work. Some of y'all are like, what? Let me ask you right now. Do you know someone right now who works really hard and they're not where they want to be? Hard work doesn't take you to the top. It's important. It's, it's critical. But, it's, but, but it doesn't differentiate you. And so what they shared was there's really four different components. The, 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 the four is mentorship, uh, have the ability to build a relationship with, a, with, with someone who can, who can feed into you, someone who's been to where you want to be, right? Mentorship. The, 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 the second was leadership skills. The ability to lead a group of people in order to reach a goal, right, successfully. Third is political savvy, being able to navigate complex relationships and situations. And fourth, your network. And again, I couldn't, I was over here just smiling, cheesing, just cheesing. Because the chairman and every commissioner that came up here talked about the network. You have to have the ability to have access to information and resources that you don't personally have at a moment's notice. Those four things are critical for your success. What ties all those things together are your relationships. Your ability to build a relationship with a mentor. Your ability to build relationships with your, your colleagues as you lead them. Your ability to, to, to manage difficult and complex relationships during political savvy. Your ability to have and build very intentional relationships to build a network. It's all relationships. And so what, what I did, I created this model, the 4C connection model, that again, this is a whole conversation. We don't got time for today. Um, maybe y'all should bring me back. Plug it in. Um, but is, th this model was meant to be able to help anyone build a more intentional and strategic relationships. Whether you're experienced, unexperienced, introvert, extrovert, doesn't matter, as long as you for, follow these, these four steps. Really quickly, mindset change. Mindset change is first, understand that networks is important. That relationships are important. That doesn't make you sleazy if you get an opportunity because someone offered you opportunity. I can't tell you how many people say, well, if they offer me opportunity because I know them, doesn't that mean I'm not that smart? I didn't work hard for it? No. Again, one of the commissioners just talked about it. Someone came to her specifically and said, hey, they're looking for this. You interested? That's a relationship. Mindset change. Next is internal clarity. Understanding you. We started we start our conversation off today with this. What do you want? What are your needs? What are your desires? What, 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 what are your values? Where are you trying to go? What resources do you have access to so you can help other people? Understanding yourself, that's internal clarity. External clarity is now you focus on others. You know where you want to go. You know what you need. You know what resources you have access to. But now who has those resources that you need? Who has the advice? Who has the opportunities that you need? Where are they at? Who are their friends? Who are their enemies? What do they value? How can you help them reach their goals? External clarity. Last one is behavior choice. Now that you've come in contact with these people, what do you say? What do you do to truly foster a meaningful connection with this next person? I, I, I promise you, this is something that's critical for not only your success as a, in personal development, but if you want to make any type of impact on your community, one, too small, one is too small a number to make any significant impact. It will require you bringing people with you. People 
you have relationships with. So here are those four. If you, I saw some people writing down really quickly. Mentorship, leadership, political savvy, and strategic networks. These are critical, critical. And again, this is normally a longer conversation, but I did want to create a resource specifically for you so you can start cre um, creating your own strategic network. Takes 10 minutes to go through it. It's super critical, su super easy resource for you. Okay, now, I've been talking a lot about how, you know, it's important for people to, to, to build relationships with, with leaders who care about them, who are, who are, who are, who are who can, who can mentor them, who can help grow them, provide opportunities, and so on and so forth. Th th that's important. And for all y'all leaders in here, don't just look back, reach back. Every single one of you has had some type of experience in your career where you said, oh, I wish I would have known that. Why didn't someone tell me this? How did I, why, why did I have to go through this challenge in time if someone could have just brought me along? It doesn't help someone to say, hey, look, that person over there, shoot. If they had this book, they would have known. If they had this advice, they would have known. If they would have had this opportunity, they would have known. Give them that book. Give them the advice. Provide them with the opportunity. Don't just look back. Actually reach back and bring someone else with you. I... I I love to, I, so I don't have my, my I'm going to show you my book up here, um, The Relationships That Work, on the cover. So I'm super intentional, overly intentional. Um, if you look at the cover of it, there are some chess pieces on there. It's very, very, very intentional purpose. Um, everyone here familiar with the game of chess? Everyone here? Yeah? I mean, you don't got to actually be like super strategic, right? But you, you know what chess is, right? Okay, I need you all to shout it out. The answer, what I'm going to ask, okay? Shout out the answer, okay. You got two chess players playing. Both of them are just as smart, just as creative, just as resilient, just as everything. Who wins the match? Person with the ivory or person with the black pieces? Come on, I know, huh? I heard something, I'm sorry. I heard person that goes first, person with the best strategies. I heard you say something in the red shirt. Most aggressive. Oh, okay, okay. That's why you're wearing that, that power red. I see you. <laughs> Whoever plays the long game. I love it, madam. The, the person who gets, that is a great answer, actually. She said the person who gets checkmate. For, for y'all online, I hope you're writing this down. I wanna, you should write down what your answer is so when I say it, you can be like, yeah, I said that, or, oh, shoot, I was, I, I was here. The person with the ivory chess pieces. I see some people shaking their head. You, you, you're a chess player. Yeah. See, in the game of chess, the person with the ivory pieces goes first. You know, there's a lot of research into that question. And they literally found from a statistical standpoint, the person with the ivory pieces generally wins more, all things being equal, simply because first, first move. They went first. I'm going to ask it a different way. How many of y'all, how many of y'all think you can beat me in, in a 50-yard race? Okay, I got, I got one person. I got two. Hold, hold on, let's talk Kim. I, 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 need, I need two people up here real quick. Who thinks they can beat me in a, let's say, let's say a race from this wall to this wall? Who, who, who can beat me? Who can beat me? Come on. Now everybody's shy. No, no one want to be on TV. Okay. We'll hypothetically do it, right? <laughs> I promise y'all I'll smoke every one of y'all. I got wheels, okay? But the wheels don't matter. If we were in a 50-yard race, and I got a 40-yard head start, I'm beating y'all every single day of the week. <laughs> it doesn't matter how smart y'all are, how creative, how, how fast, how muscular, how, how much I'm in my good shoes today. All that matters is I move first. 
My point being, take action. Take action. Don't wait for an opportunity to come to you. Don't wait for someone to ask you to do something. Don't wait for someone to say, hey, look, here's an opportunity. Don't wait. Do something today. Because even when you do something today, if you're not doing it perfectly, if you do it early enough, you're still leagues ahead of everybody else. Who over here worried about, did I do it the right way? Again, I'm going to be real, real quick. I, I published, I was telling, <laughs> telling Tanisha, I published over 200 YouTube videos. 200 YouTube videos. Um, my first video is of me laying off the side of bed with a stretched out white t-shirt on, and I was responding to a young lady who, who emailed me via Facebook who said, Alex, I've been watching you for years. You've been my mentor for years. I didn't know that. She was just watching me. And I, I thought the idea of unconscious mentoring, right? And so from that idea, I'm like, I had to say something. So I did my first video. I can't, it got a bunch, of, a bunch of views. It was really cool. The messed up part of that story is that I had been wanting to do a video for three years prior. I was waiting for the perfect time. You don't wait. Fear is, a, fear is real. Fear, fear, fear is hard. The answer to fear, taking action. The longer you allow your mind to sit with your fear, the more creative your mind will become with creating an even bigger scenario of what will happen and what if this and what if that and almost, does that, does that ever happen? Does the worst case scenario ever happen? We're not friends. <laughs> Generally speaking, no. So the best way to counteract that is to take action. Take, don't allow your mind the time to build up those fears. Take action. I promise you, you'll figure it out. So again, I don't care who I was a race. In a 40-yard dash, I'm, be, I'm smoking everybody. In a 50-yard dash with a 40-yard head start, I'm smoking everybody. So it doesn't matter how fast you are, how smart you are. All that matters is that you start. So take action today. Don't wait. Now with all that said, as we talked about before, you're going to fail. Things aren't going to always work out. I, I, remember a, I remember a time, <laughs> this stays here, okay? For y'all, y'all watching, don't, don't be telling nobody about this. This is, this is Vegas rules, um, prior to YouTube, Vegas rules. Um, I remember that I was serving as chief of staff um, at, this, at this National Park Service, and, and I, in that role, I oversaw communications as well, right? And so every time a media outlet came to us, it was my job to, to coordinate an answer, make sure we, the answer represented the organization well, as, as well as the department, and ultimately the president, right? And that was my job. So a media outlet comes to us and says, hey, we're about to run a story about you. Here's, here's our draft of the story. I look at it, I'm like, oh, this is not good. This is not accurate. Cool. Bring my team together. All of us start working through it, finding the right answers, the right data. The problem is that the timeline that we needed to get it done was not going to meet their publishing timeline. Oh, shoot. The day before their deadline, I talked to my boss. Boss says, uh, Alex, don't submit. <laughs> Have you been drinking? I don't miss deadlines. People, people bring me in to get things done and get things done on time. I don't miss deadlines. That night, I worked all night. Next day, worked all, all day until that deadline hit. And then I said, you know what? I'm about to make the executive decision because I know what's best. So I submitted. I submitted our incomplete response to the media outlet. About two hours later, my boss found me in the field. Um, she was not happy. She said, Alex, didn't I ask you not to submit that, that, that to the media? I said, well, yeah, you did, but see, the, the, the deadline was about to hit, so I want to make... If I asked you not to submit, why did you do it? And at that moment, 
I had nothing to say. And I take my work very seriously. On my way home that day, and I promise you, this is real, I was crying. I, I was boohooing, probably had snot coming out my nose. It was not pretty. I, I mean, I thought I was getting fired. I mean, this, working in the DC area, that can blow up fast. And I thought if I didn't get fired, then I, I, I probably needed to resign. That was the respectable thing to do. So I get on the phone with my mentor, I'm talking to him, and he says, uh, he says, Alex, calm down, chill out, chill out. He says, the reality is that you are where you are because you've taken risks. That is why you've been able to elevate yourself to this position. And if you want to continue moving up the ranks, you're going to continue to take risks. That's the only way. The important thing is to one, learn from this mistake and never do it again. <laughs> and that was a great lesson for me. Because it taught me two things. One, a failure doesn't have to kill your career, right? That's really important. Most of us don't take that risk that we feel like we really need to take because we're worried about failure. Is, if I fail, everything will be gone. It generally doesn't happen. Second, <laughs> taught me a very important lesson in a leadership role. Not all deadlines are that important. Sometimes, if you don't have the right information, it's better just to not submit. And I, I can't believe how, how helpful that has come throughout my career since then. So be prepared for failure and know that you will be okay. You will work your way through it. And, and, and finally, I, I want to leave us with, don't be afraid to be first. I, I remember I was, I was being interviewed for a, a panel discussion a few years ago for a, for a college. Um, and uh, one of the people in the audience actually looked just like this. Um, they said, hey, Alex, uh, or no, the panelists, what would you do if, you, if you're looking at an organization but they, they lack diversity? The first panelist said, well, if they don't have diversity, I'm not going. See, because I look at Glassdoor.com, and I, and I make sure to see I have some diversity and some inclusion and so on and so forth, and all, all like this, so everyone clapped. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Next panelist said, well, actually, I'm the same thing. Because if they don't have diversity, then how I know they're going to be inclusive to me? Right? I mean, it m makes sense. Cool, cool, everyone claps. This is my turn. And I say, uh, y'all not going to like what I have to say. Uh, the reality is that if you want to go somewhere and make change, go somewhere and make change. Someone's got to be first. When I managed, when I was overseeing executive leaders development for Interior, I was the one, the youngest, at 23 years old, made no sense. Two, generally the only person of color in every single meeting I was in with all the, with the assistant secretaries and all the other SESs and, and, and deputy assistant secretaries. I was the only one like me, generally speaking, there. It was uncomfortable. It, 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 wasn't, it wasn't easy at the t all times. Yeah, there may be some, some expectations that, that were not right, that were placed on me. But I grew. I learned. I became more resilient. I, I met phenomenal people like these leaders over here, Tanisha and Kim, all because I was willing to put myself in a situation where I was first. And I didn't just look back, I reached back. I created programs, policies, uh, opportunities, initiatives that made sure that I wasn't the last. My, my wife loves one of the shirts I have made. It says, I may be the first in my family, but I won't be the last. Because it's always about coming in, having that power, the influence we talked about, and then doing good. For yes, the public and the agency. And by doing good for the agency, you're doing good for the public. So don't be afraid to be first. I, I tell you, the, 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 the chairman, he knew it was going to be difficult for him. He knew it coming in and having the focus on inclusion and diversity and being the first to have such a focus on this was going to be hard, it was going to be difficult, it was going to be challenging. He knew this. 
And yes, he began by talking about it and making sure that everyone knew this was his focus, but then he took steps to make sure it wasn't just his word. He put his money where his mouth was, and he brought in the first chief diversity officer. The first. Wasn't it, was it easy? Is it easy? She's saying not easy, but it's work that needs to get did, done. And you know how I know that they're making real progress and, and they're actually doing things that matter is because you're here. This is the first time this event has been done. The first time this form has been in place. This is the first. Everyone in this room is here to help you. Whether you're in person or whether you're online, all the resources, all the time, the energy put into this has been here to help you. So I encourage you, think big. Know what you want. Take, take, take the time to, 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 to go after grand opportunities. Here at, this, at, uh, at this agency, they have so many phenomenal things they're doing. Dream big, go big or go home. Understand that you can be confident in your incompetence. Know that at some point you are gonna fail and it's okay. And as long as you have the relationships around you, you will be successful. So I encourage all of you, don't, don't just walk away today. Walk behind there, talk to some people. If you're online, stay online and be engaged for these next few days. Don't, don't just sit here and say, this was nice and it made me feel good. Do something about it. Take action today. As always, I encourage everyone here, stay strong, stay positive, and definitely stay moving. Thank you so much for allowing me to be here today. So my name's Shannon Giles. I work in the Human Resources Office. I do recruitment and staffing, and I handle the unpaid internship program. So I'd like to share with you a little bit about the CFTC. We are the Commodities Futures Trading Commission. And some of the things that we're going to talk about today, um, this is a this is an overview. We're not going to get into some of these topics as far as benefits and the application process and um, some of these other things because you'll you'll get that later on in other presentations. So the CFTC is a government financial regulatory agency. It is commonly known as the a FIREA. Um, it was established in 1975, and our mission is actually to promote integrity, resilience and vibrancy of the U.S. derivatives markets through sound regulation. We have four locations. We are, they are in major cities, Chicago, Kansas City, New York, and our headquarters is in uh, D.C. So one of our major occupations that we recruit for are attorneys. Um, there's different levels to the attorney's position. So for this is for a... Um, a full-time position, um, this would not apply to students. These The rules, you know, must have a JD degree and bar membership. That would not currently apply to our students, but that's for our employees. Some other jobs that we recruit for regularly are auditors, economists, futures trading specialists, investigators, and analysts. And then we have a handful of different management positions like Omni, like HR, IT. And then we also have a student employment section. So I would like to just take some time and briefly go over the management uh, professional positions. They support the CFTC's mission directly. And like I said, some of these are budget, contracting, information technology, human resources, um, there's a lots of different program managers, project managers, excuse me. And the qualifications and requirements for these positions, they do vary. Our student employment program, we have a pathways program, and this includes an internship, a paid internship program, as well as a recent grad program. We typically hire for these positions we like to put the vacancy out on USA Jobs around December, January, February, around that time to start recruiting early. What we give is we'll provide you some on-the-job training that will give you experience 
professional experience. And then we also have a student unpaid internship program. So how this works is we have a open continuous vacancy on USA jobs. That means that it's open year round so that we can always collect interns resumes. And so we always know who's interested in working with us. It's an applicant list. So every month at the end of every, or excuse me, at the beginning of every month, Interested parties that might have opportunities to hire an intern will receive the applicant list and they can look through it and see if the students, if there's any students in there that meet their interest. Um, one of the questions that we get is, how long do you stay on this list? You'll be on this list for six months. So you apply once and then your application is available for six months. After the six month mark, you'll get an email that says from USA Jobs that says that your six months is almost up. And if you would like to reapply, by all means, please reapply. Another question that we get pretty frequently is, is there separate list for each region? We understand that students might physically live certain places and then go to school other places. So yes, we do take interns at DC, Chicago, New York, and Kansas City. Now at this time, I would like to know if there's any questions from anyone or anything that you guys would like for me to go into uh, with more detail. You can absolutely write your questions in the chat. You can write them to everyone. You can write them to me directly. Okay, so Pathways Program. Our Pathways Program, we typically hire, I would say most commonly uh, law students, as well as we've been hiring data scientists. It's a pretty new career path for our agency and the federal government as well, but we did have a handful of data science positions. Um, these, these interns can work from six weeks up until the end of the semester, or if there's something, if they're, you're able to work something out with your supervisor, we can extend that at some points, but not always. Um, let me see what else. How does one get involved with the HR side of the house? So that's a good question. We are actually currently um, discussing putting a unpaid internship vacancy out for administrative positions. So that would be a good way to apply. You can also, my contact, um, if it's not in this presentation, it is, I can get it to everybody. Um, you can reach out to me as well, and I can have, you know, separate conversations with you when it comes to HR. How long do these internships typically run? So, um, like I said, they typically, it depends on the type of internship that you're on. A unpaid internship can go up until about a year. Um, again, there's flexibilities. One, one answer doesn't fit all. Um, is the Pathways recent graduate program available for law school graduates? And are you planning that are planning to sit for the bar? To be honest, I will have to get back to you on that answer. I'm not 100% sure what our qualifications are currently for um, the recent grad law positions, but I can absolutely get back to you on that. Um, we do not have any, it's, the question is, do we have any positions in California? So as of today, we are still remote as long as you're not a supervisor. So students would be remote. So technically, yes, we, um, you would be able to work from California currently. Now, if we have a return to work policy come into place, then that would affect, you know, everybody in the commission. So that things would change at that point, but we're not at that point yet. So um, yes, you could remotely work from California. Are there internships for paralegals? 
Um, yeah, there could be. I don't, you know, I don't see why not. Is there usually a requirement for what year undergrads you are? Um, it depends on the series itself. Each series has different expectations and different requirements. So like the data scientist will have different requirements than the a law position um, is versus a management or a you know admin position. Um, should we apply using a federal resume format and template? To be honest, um, you're still very early on in your careers and you're in school. So I wouldn't limit yourself to only a federal resume. Um, I would say to put on there as much information as possible because in HR, when we review resumes, we can't assume anything. So if you can go into detail about your different, you know, things on your resume, that would be great. Do we have positions for social work students? Uh, we at, currently do not have any social work positions. Um, unfortunately, it, it's not really in the line of what we do. I'm not saying that we couldn't. Um, I would still advise um, people to apply no matter what your major is because your skill set might, might be what we're looking for and it might not exactly be um, always your degree related. Is it common for people to reapply uh, after each six months? So to be honest, we just tried, this is our first year um, trying this process in USA Jobs. So it hasn't been six months yet. Um, I will be able to answer that in a couple, like two months, I think it will be six months. And what is the turnover rate? Um, the turnover rate, that's that's a kind of open-ended question because we have students that come in here for six months in and out. They, they have a project. They know what they're working on. So it's a different turnover rate, I would say, than like a regular federal employee. Um, up to what extent age? Um, age never matters for any position in the federal government um, unless it's a, I believe, police officer and a fire firefighter might have age requirement. Um, but as far as the CFTC goes, we actually do not have any age requirements. The limited or the experience that you would that you would need, it's typically done by the level of the position. So we hire a seven, you know that there's going to be a lot more room for entry level experience versus a, you know, a nine, 11, or, you know, when it goes up. Yep. We do have a suitability office. Um, sorry guys, there's 21 questions. This is great. I'm so, I'm so happy with how interested you guys are. Um, again, the requirements, it, it's based on the position itself, the series and the position. Can you take an internship while working full-time on a federal grant at a college? Yes, you can take an internship. Um, you would have to work out your timing with between your school and the person that you're working for, but you can certainly um, balance it if you're able to. Yep, internships are currently remote. And I wanted to thank everybody for joining and I want to wish everybody luck on their careers and their futures.